<laughs> All right, so we have done a lot. So far, everyone we've talked about gets thrown into the broad category of the pre-Socratics, which kind of shows you how important Socrates is, but we're not going to get to him till, till next class. Um, today, I want to explain you the world in which Socrates lived, because so far, all our philosophers have come from Asia Minor, <coughs> which is modern day Turkey, uh, mostly on the coast there of Asia Minor of Turkey, where it hits the Adriatic Ocean. Is that right? No, that's the Aegean, the Aegean, the Adriatics in between Greece and Italy. So uh, along the Aegean Sea and we have Miletus and Ephesus are all over there where modern day Turkey is on the coast, Mediterranean coast. And today we're moving to Athens. And Athens was definitely a hub. I gave you a little background of the history of Athens and the Peloponnesian War. This is kind of leading up to it. And these people in Athens also have a philosophic tradition going. They're aware of what's happened in Miletus and Ephesus and these other Greek city-states. And a class of, we'll call them philosophers, although I really don't want to claim them, but they were called sophists. And sophists can literally be translated wise guys. I'm sure it's coming from the root word sophia, which means wisdom. So sophists maybe nobly could say they're lovers of wisdom, but that's really not what they were about. They really were agnostic when it came to the truth. Like I'm talking capital T, truth, objective reality, universals. And it's hard to blame them seeing all these different guys we've talked about. We had Thales with water, Anaximander with the indeterminate, Anaximenes with air, Heraclitus with fire, and then we get the pluralists combining the elements together, and even the atomists talking about it's not just four, there's like all these different eternal, indestructible particles that keep being broken down and rearranged over and over again. And so by the time we get to the fifth century in Athens, people have kind of given up on humans being able to know truth. So they become agnostic about the truth. And hence we get the term skeptic, which we still use that word today, right? To talk about a, a disbelief. And so skepticism was alive and well in fifth century Athens, along with another group called the cynics. So the skeptics and cynics were actually different schools of philosophy. The cynics, um, we still use that word today to have distrust or doubt. We, we want to know why people are doing stuff because we know people don't do stuff for goodness sakes. We want to know what are they going to get out of it? What's their angle? What's their, what's their payoff? I remember as a young man, I was incredibly cynical. I just figured nobody did something for nothing. Everyone had an angle. Everyone wanted to get something out of it. And I had an uncle who invited me to come live with him. He'd provide me a job, let me go to school. And I was so cynical. I asked him straight up. I'm like, what do you get out of this arrangement? And he just laughed. And he said, I just want to help you out. And But I was so cynical, I couldn't even comprehend the idea of someone wanting to just help another human being just for the sake of helping them. And so cynics, um, I, I think it comes from the Greek word kion, which is related closely to canine. And if you think about dogs, dogs are really the most cynical animals, domesticated animals I know of, because if you walk by a house that's not yours and they have a dog, that dog is just going to assume you were up to no good, right? It's going to bark. It's going to be all like, hey, there's a stranger out front. Alarm, alarm, warning, warning. And that's like a very cynical attitude. It's, it's not expecting a stranger is coming there to bless you or do something good for your family. You're assuming they're up to no good. So cynics are related to that idea of always trying to look for what's in it. What's the payoff? What is this actually going to cost me? The sophists were specialists in rhetoric. 
and rhetoric is the art of speaking or debate, persuasive speech speaking. And I believe it's still like the number one major at schools like UC Berkeley and others. A lot of people going into law or politics will major in rhetoric. And it's, it's like the art of debating. And what these, I love the, the cartoon Palmer has here. Here you got the sophist in a wagon and on the side of the wagon, it says snake oil salesman. And that's kind of like what these guys were, but not with with cures and ointments, but with ideas and concepts. And so they would travel from town to town and they would put on demonstrations of their skill set. So they could say, pick any topic under the sun. It could be religious, it could be political, it could be social. And first they would debate one side of it as convincingly and persuasively as possible and then they would step back and turn the other way. And then they would argue just as passionately, just as persuasively from the other point of view. And so what they were teaching, what they were offering their students was basically a degree in rhetoric or debate. And this was very important in Athens because Athens was a very litigious society, but they didn't have professional lawyers. So these leading families, it was very important to have at least one member or to train up your children in the art of sophistry or rhetoric so that they could defend your interests in the public square if push came to shove with some of your other citizens. And so that's kind of the world that we've entered into. Now, one of the guys at this time period who deserves his own shout out is um, Protagoras. And the, the commentator Palmer says, perhaps the most famous and least cynical of the sophists was Protagoras. And his dates are 490 to 422. And he taught that the way to achieve success was through a careful and prudent acceptance of traditional customs, not because they were true, but because an understanding and manipulation of them is expedient. Um, basically what he's putting forth is human subjectivity and relativity. And his big claim to fame was his statement, homo mensura, which means man is the measure or man is the measure of all things. And he took this so far as to say, even the gods, the Greek gods are made in the image of man. Do you see how it takes like the Hebrew Genesis account and flips it on its head where Genesis tells us man was made in the image and likeness of God. The Greeks, at least Protagoras is saying, no, we made the gods in our image. And when you look at the Greek gods, that's exactly what they are, right? They're like, personifications of human traits and qualities into the heavens. They're just bigger, badder, tougher versions of humans. They have the same foibles, the same virtues, the same flaws on a grander divine scale. But the, the Greek gods are very anthropomorphic, most of them. And remember that term means attributing human qualities or traits to non-human things. Man is the measure of all things. I mean, that's intense to think about, but it is kind of like how we are in our modern society. It's like we've kind of gone full circle all the way back to the ancient Greek materialists with this idea that we may not be able to know if there's a God or gods or not, but we can look around. And since humans are the highest form of living being on the planet, at least that we're aware of, well, we should be the ones that get to say what is true, what is good, what is beautiful. Those are coming from human value judgments and perspectives. And so that's Protagoras. Man is the measure of all things. And this really highlighted, since we can't know absolute truth, well, then you better be able to make your version of truth better than the next guys. So that's where we're at in Greek society and culture with the sophist. A couple of the others, Gorgias, um, 
he wanted to dethrone philosophy and replace it with rhetoric. This is Gorgias, G-O-R-G-I-A-S. And he, he tried to prove the following theses. There is nothing. If there were anything, no one could know it. And if anyone did know it, no one would be able to communicate that. And in a lot of ways, that's kind of where we are at philosophy today. We've come full circle to um, one of the great linguistic philosophers of the 19th, 20th century was called Wittgenstein. And Wittgenstein basically came to the conclusion that we do not have the language to do philosophy. And this is like 2000 years later, 24, 2500 years later, we have philosophers still wrestling with this idea that even if we could think in these terms, we don't have the human words or language to properly conceive of it, let alone express it to others. Okay, so like, is the it like the absolute truth that they're talking about or like the underlying? Yeah, they do not believe we can know absolute truth. That the sophists just believe since we can't know it, then we need to become experts at telling our truth, little t truth. And we need to try to convince others that our little t truth is the big t truth that other people should follow. But they were very cynical and skeptical about truth being knowable. They didn't think humans could know truth. Kind of similar to our postmodern times we're living in, right? These are pre-moderns, these are ancients, but they are wrestling with a lot of the same issues. What is truth? How can we know it? And if we can't know it, then what should we put our interest in? It's really interesting, like after all this time, um, like people have been trying so hard to find truth apart from God and it just leads to even more confusion. Sure. And this is a God saturated society, but even there you see what Protagoras has done. He's kind of, drug the Greek gods down from Mount Olympus and basically is saying these are constructs of the human mind. These are projections we've made upwards as humans. It's not that the gods made us or are in charge of us, but we are actually the ones that keep them going by our devotion, our worship, those sorts of things. I mean, how would, you, how would you even begin to try to argue with a sophist, though? Because not only do they know your arguments, they know all the counter-arguments. And they can do both with equal conviction because they don't believe in anything. Do any of you think you know an absolute truth that you would roll out to a sophist? <laughs> How about you, Autumn? Do you have any absolute truths in your back pocket? Um, like the only absolute truths I can think of are ones that don't come from me. Like they come from God. Like what? <laughs> yeah, see, that's hard to miss. Well, give like, me an absolute truth you believe comes from God. Well, like, hmm. I was going to say in the Ten Commandments, but yeah. Those seem like pretty absolute. Really? Or like the fact that like God is good. Or like God is just. I feel like characteristics of God are absolute. God are absolute truths. And do like, you, you think know, goodness is absolute or do you think that's relative? Well, like I guess. What may be good for me might not be so good for you. Or am I not using the word good correctly? Well, but it's not relative to me. But that's just completely different than what they think. Do you think you know what good is? Um, not like in its purest form. Okay. And that's kind of where the sophists are at. It's like, if yeah. we can't know, then it's just kind of opinion. And mm -hmm. if it's just about opinion and taste or preference, well... 
let's get really good at persuading other people that our opinion is the right one. Since it's really just boils down to a battle of opinions. And everyone's got their own, but if we can get a group of people on board with the same opinion, that might be worth something. And so that is, their, that is what they were offering. The skill set, how to persuade others that your point of view is the right one, even though they in no way are pretending that they believe in an absolute truth, capital T truth. But see, even taking something like this idea that God can give us absolutes, well, it just begs the question. And that's a phil philosophic way of saying, which God? And how do you know? How is that God bringing his truth to you? All of those are going to be really problematic. And so yeah. you say, well, the one true God, the God of Abraham, um, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, the, the creator, the creator God, Yahweh, that one, that's the one we're talking about. Well, why did you pick that one? Some desert God of the Hebrews. Why not Ra of the Egyptians or Brahman? of the Hindus. I mean, why not Zeus? Why not Apollo? I mean, why are you fixated on this Hebrew deity? Where does that come from? You don't have to answer those questions, Autumn. Oh, I was just about to say as well. Yeah. If you have any answers, throw them out there, and I will show you what a sophist would do with them. Well, essentially, I guess, like, what I would say is the reason why I wouldn't pick like any Greek gods or a god of a specific thing is because they're not an absolute um, like supreme being in the, in that sense is they're not all powerful. So the reason I would pick the Hebrew god as you're just, the way you're describing it, um, god of the Bible, is because he's the god of everything and all things, um, and he has control of all of that. And so for us to find any other being that is created by man as a god is no is no longer a god because it's created by man. That's essentially what I would say. So it's definitely one thing that's not how god. And how, how do you know about this god, Everett? Because he reveals himself to, uh, to us in our word, in in the word. The word, the Bible. Okay, but the Bible is a composite, and if you're talking about the Tanakh the 39 yeah. books of the Old Testament. Yeah. I mean, that's written over hundreds of years by many different authors and with editorial comments. And why are you putting your trust into those people that they're telling you accurately who God is? And the descriptions are really different how God's described in Genesis than how he's described later on. For example, God's is presented in the beginning of the Bible as like this primordial creator force spirit, right? Like God is light. God is pure light. The spirit of God is brooding across the surface of the waters. But then by the time we get to Moses, God is like this um, very jealous, vengeful being and protective of his plan and his purpose. And he's willing to take on all the gods and goddesses of Egypt. It's like a God off, right? That's what the 10 plagues was all about. The God of the Hebrews versus the gods of the Egyptians. And so you have this God off. And then once he gets them out into the desert, all of a sudden, instead of just being this God of supernatural wonder and power and destruction, he becomes this God of law with like the Ten Commandments. And then God's presented as like a king, like the king of the universe. And then God's presented as like a suffering servant and, okay. and as a man. And it's just like, this is all in the same book. Right. So if I you look at the Bible as a, as a singular book, we have all these various descriptions of God. Correct. Right. Right. But I guess is um, where I would counter that is I would say that just as I can be angry in a certain circumstantial situation as anything as I reflect as like God has made us in our image like I am one person I am one being in my own self I'm not a God or anything like that but just as those 
different circumstances cause for different reactions, I would say, because it makes no sense if God is, like, saying a subservient, like, dude, when, like, Moses brings down the Ten Commandments because of what the um, Israelites were doing at the time, the same thing with the Egyptians, God wouldn't be this, just like, oh, like, oh, whatever, dude, like, do your thing, it's like other gods were, I want to say, threatening his existence, but were being idolized over him. In that sense, he wouldn't be a pushover in that sense. So different circumstances in those cases, in those stories, in the writing would cause for a different action. Just as, um, for example, for me, like, I guess for today, sake of an argument, I'm not going to have the same swing um, at a curveball that I am going to have at a fastball. Like, there's a difference in the approach and how I'm going to hit that pitch. I'm not going to swing at a curveball like it's a fastball because if I do that, I'm going to be too early on the pitch. I'm going to swing over it or whatever. Whereas I have to make that adjustment just in the same way as God has to make the adjustment to certain circumstances. And that's what makes him God as well because he's in control of all those things. Whereas one God would be, oh, for that one specific item and that God would be for that specific item. Like, it, it, that doesn't make sense. Okay. Um even if I give you that the God of the Hebrews is the true God and that mm -hmm. the scriptures were really given by that God for our mm -hmm. instruction, what makes you think you have the ability to interpret those scriptures correctly? I, I'm assuming you don't know Hebrew, so right. already you're having to deal with someone else's translation, which right. involves interpretation. So you're already having to go through one set of interpretation just in it being mm -hmm. translated so you can read it. And then you have to deal with it's being written by a people that had a different view of God, like having children, right? Because mm -hmm. the Jews whose book the Tanakh is, they do not believe Jesus is God incarnate. Mm -hmm. And they're reading the same scriptures, right? It's their scriptures, but they're coming to very different conclusions to who the messiah is what he'll be like he won't be divine he'll simply be like a, a warlord a, like the judges of old that that sort of thing so that was a ramble on my part but mm -hmm. the question is basically how do you know you're interpreting god's will correctly well that's where faith comes in i would assume correct <laughs> Right, but faith is no longer knowledge. It's right. Okay, belief. yeah, that's fair. And so that's that's a really important distinction. The Greeks aren't making it quite yet, but we're going to get there. The difference between knowing something and believing something. And I just yeah. saw one of my former students post up um, that a lot of people think he's smart, and he says, "I'm not really smart." He says, "I only know like." a few things. Uh, mostly I'm just quoting smart people. And so it makes me look smart. And I wrote him a note and I said, don't feel bad. I said, I I'm twice your age and I only know like five things and I can only remember three of them at any given time. And, and what I mean by that kind of knowledge, it means there is no way it could not be true. There is no counter. And let me give you an example. And, and we don't get this until I don't know, maybe it's actually St. Augustine is arguing against the skeptics because they're still around. 800 years later, Augustine is dealing with them. And a skeptic, I'll say this slowly, but it's such a great little mantra. The skeptic's mission statement, basically, or statement of faith, however you want to put it, was, we don't believe in anything, including the proposition we do not believe in anything. I'll say that one more time. We do not believe in anything, including the proposition that we do not believe in anything. And they had to add that qualifier, otherwise they would have believed that they didn't believe in anything. That would have been one, one thing they would have had. So they had to qualify even that. And so St. Augustine, 800 years later, there's still skeptics around. There's still skeptics today, and we're in the 21st century. But St. Augustine simply asked them, he said, who is it that doesn't believe in anything? <laughs> and if they said, 
me, Bob, I don't believe anything. He'd say, well, Bob, you at least believe there's a Bob. So that's one thing. And then by the time we get to Descartes, right, he, he has his cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. And he realized whether he was thinking clearly or being deceived in his head, there was still a him that was thinking. Whether he was thinking correctly or incorrectly, there was still a him. Now, one of my students, this was two years ago, I think, said, well, what if we're just computer programs and we've been programmed to think that we're thinking things or that, that we exist? And I actually don't have an, I guess my answer would still be like Descartes. Even if we are a computer program who has been programmed to think that we think, there is still a me that has been programmed. I think that would be the retort. So I can still know that there's a me that has been programmed. Even though the programming may not be me, there's still a me that was programmed. <laughs> but that's, that's not a lot. And then you could say, well, I know that I exist because I'm a thing that thinks, which means that I can know things, which means that I can know more than one thing. But then it gets silly after that, right? So there's three things I can know. I'm a thing that thinks, which means I can know things, which means I can know multiple things. But beyond that, it's all belief, baby. <laughs> and what else? We got the cynics, the skeptics, the sophists. So let me just give you a little lead into Socrates, and then I'm, I'm going to call this for today. It will be enough. Um, Socrates... I, Socrates is living in this world with all these sophists and skeptics and cynics. But unlike them, he was not an agnostic when it came to knowledge. He really thought we could know things. He just realized he didn't know anything yet. And so he would always question, he, whenever someone came to Athens that claimed to know something, whether that was what is good, what is true? What is beautiful? What is love? What is courage? He would find that person and he would begin to question them. And I'll try to find for our next class a Socratic dialogue where he's doing this question and answer with the other. And it doesn't take long before both the person who claimed to have known something and Socrates realize this person has no idea what they're talking about. And it's a great teaching technique. You just don't want to discourage people too much, walking them down that path of showing them what they actually don't know. And Socrates was a master at it. I think it's a fantastic way to teach because instead of just having someone pontificate at you and tell you what to believe, what is true, what you need to know, Socrates is walking alongside you and he's having a conversation and you're both learning and growing together as you have this exchange of dialogue. Unfortunately, as, as far as I can remember, all of so Socrates' dialogues end in this frustration of, you really don't know, do you? <laughs> and, but he, was, he didn't let himself become a cynic or a skeptic. He believed he was, he called himself the gadfly of the gods. And just like an annoying little insect or fly, he believed his role in Athenian society was to keep pestering folks to think about, to question what they thought they knew, what they believed to be true. And oftentimes, indeed, it wasn't. But a lot of times people don't want to be challenged about what they think. They can get quite defensive. They can get quite hostile. And that is what happened to Socrates. You can imagine he was a big hit among the youth of Athens because he was always questioning what the authorities and the adults were doing. And at least when I was a youth, I always loved hearing adults get questioned or held to account on things they were rolling out especially if they were civic or public leaders. It was great to see someone show that they really didn't know what they were talking about. And 
Socrates did get into trouble because the youth, of course, sang his praises, but the old people saw him as someone disrupting Athenian society, someone disrespecting the gods, and someone basically corrupting the youth. And they were sick of it. So, for example, say Socrates is hanging out with his, his young students, and Bobby goes, sorry, Sock, I got to go. My family's offering a bull to Athena today at the temple. And Socrates might say something simple like, um, what does Athena need with a bull? And so the kid goes home and the parents say, are you ready to go to the temple? And the kid says, what does Athena need with a bull? Well, it's not going to go well, right? Like, where did you get that blasphemous talk, boy? And it's like, with Socrates. Socrates is always talking like that. And so we're going to pick up with Socrates next class. But this is the world he lives in, full of sophists, cynics, and skeptics. But he believes truth is attainable. But it needs to be done through this process of questions and, and answers. Any questions before I let you go? No? All right. Well, since we are ahead of ourselves, I think that's plenty for today. And we'll pick up with Socrates and the golden age of Athenian philosophy on Thursday. Awesome. Thanks, Fred. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Fred.